They asked me if you want to share as well. So my lecture today is on the impacts, human impacts on wetland systems in Colorado and Tobago. And I'll start doing like, um, I'll start off describing wetlands first of all. Yes, I'll start off by describing wetlands. I'll give a general overview of wetlands, the wetlands in Trinidad, specifically along the west coast. And then I'll look at some of the impacts I come across during the surveys that I do, uh, specifically along the west coast where you have a lot of industrialization taking place and a lot of land development taking place. So, Amy, if we could go to the next slide. What I will define a wetland as is places where plants and, and animals have become adapted to temporary or permanent flooding by saline and brackish water or fresh water. Wetlands encompass emergent wetlands, marshes, rivers, swamps, forests, mangrove forests, palm forests, submerged coastal wetlands where you have seagrass beds and coral reefs, and man-made wetlands, dams, rice fields, fishing ponds, sewage ponds, those sorts of things we are describing as wetlands. Uh, the services. Okay. Um, all right. So, the services provided by wetlands. Let's look at goods. Goods extracted from wetlands, specifically in Trinidad and Tobago, will have food, fish and game, fresh water and fuel. Um, in 1974, I'm just giving some statistics that I came across. It was estimated that fish and shellfish harvested from the Caribbean swamp. What? Yes, sorry. <laughs> shellfish harvested from Caribbean swamp was worth $981,450 annually. And in 1999, it was estimated that the conch and cascadura fisheries in the River Swamp generated a net annual income of $609,000 annually. Um, so another service provided by our wetlands is um, climate regulation, um, regulation of water flow, water quality and control of erosion, storm protection, flood water retention and pollution. Uh, cultural services they also provide, they have aesthetic value for those who appreciate nature, education, spiritual value, recreation and tourism. Studies conducted in 1974 identified that the recreational resources in Karani Swamp were worth 1,038,500 TT and approximately 16,000 people visited a year. Where's the picture from? Secondly, this one, well I specifically put in this picture to show um, another form of recreational use in mangroves. This is actually a true lagoon in Tobago. And, um, they actually set up a broadwalk as part of that integrated, um, when it was developed as a Hilton Hotel, it was set, developed as an integrated hotel resort. So to encourage an appreciation for the mangrove system, they set up this broadwalk through Kachuchu Lagoon to encourage people to go and visit the site. So, in Trinidad and Tobago, we have seven species of mangroves and these are listed here. Um, there are 60 emergent wetland systems in Trinidad and Tobago, and of these 20 can be found along the west coast of Trinidad. I have a list of these here. So we have Scotland Bay, Hart's Cut, Quaisal River. Quaisal River. Yes, that's the Quaisal River. Um, Caraco Swamp, Sea Lots, Carney Swamp, La Quaisal River, Orange Valley, Hoover River, Lisa's Bay, which I usually call Point Lisa's Bay. Mangrove, Northern Claxton Bay, Central Claxton Bay, Guaracara River, Marabella River, Godino Swamp, Roselac Swamp, La Brea, Guaco River, Los Eros Bay, and Los Gallos. And on the other side, you can see the estimated sizes of these swamps. River is a wetland? Yeah, it's a Very far south. Okay. 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 
Um, so human impact to select mangrove systems along the West Coast. So some of those that I have looked at as a result of my surveys would have been land reclamation activities, changes in hydrology, road building activities, contamination from chemicals and solid waste, oil spills, fires, and harvesting of timber. So some historical overview. Let's look at the Karani Swamp. The Karani Swamp as you would know, consists of estuarine basin mangrove systems as well as brackish, shorter, and estuarine marshes, which would be closer to the highway on the eastern side of the swamp itself. Um, historically, modification to the drainage pattern in the swamp occurred under the Cipriani Reclamation Scheme in 1921 to 1922 for rice cultivation and for flood protection work. And these schemes themselves reduce the freshwater inflow into the swamp, reducing freshwater storage and increasing saltwater intrusion within that area. This in turn decreased the percentage of freshwater marsh on the eastern periphery of the Karani Swamp. Right? The, Car the Karani Swamp itself extended northwards towards the Parity bus routes. And between 1922 and 1985, 494.3 hectares were lost from the northern and southern extremes for road, for obviously development of roads, sewage treatment ponds, landfills, and river dredging. Currently, the swamp receives polluted water and sewage runoff from the entire Caribbean drainage basin. And in 2001, the IMA estimated that 170 hectares of the swamp was affected by dieback, and this was essentially attributed to the pollution that occurs. Um, within the current drainage What is dieback? Dieback is essentially where you have trees dying and they can't identify a source for why these trees are. And you normally see like a patch within the mangrove forest just there. All right, so the Point Lisa's Kuba and Claxon Bay mangrove system, which I spent a lot of time surveying, um, essentially, the Coober River mangrove system, the Point Lisas and the Claxton Bay, were three systems that once covered approximately 445 hectares of land with a, along the central coastline of Trinidad. All three systems were gradually modified into sugar plantation um, and, as you know, the Point Lisas Industrial Estate. Next. Um, the Point Lisas mangrove system in particular once had forest communities, mangrove woodland, coastal tickets, littoral woodlands, freshwater, and saline marsh communities. And between 1966 and 1981, the coverage of this vegetation community was reduced to 26 hectares, being replaced by agriculture, industry, social development, and activities such as housing. Specified activities which affected the Point Lisa's mangrove system during this time direct vegetation removal, cultivation of sugar plantation on the eastern border adjacent to the southern main road, land reclamation, deposition of dredge spoil, and alteration of the drainage patterns to support development of the Point Lisa's industrial estate, development of residential, residential communities associated with the sugar industry itself and the laying down and support of supporting infrastructure for the entire community, which would include roadways, conduits, recreational areas, and social services. Uh, these human act modifications were clearly unsuitable for the maintenance of the original climate, climate vegetation, and it was never re-established. It was considered a severe ultimate alteration to the entire community. Next. Right now, the Lisa's mangrove system essentially it, that exists is this and it's wedged between two embankments if you see this line here this is actually an outfall and this is the natural drainage system that passes through the point process industrial estate so this is uh, industrial outfall and this is essentially what remains of the system and we it's been monitored since 2004 so things that affect the Point Lisa's mangrove system now are uh, tidal activity, input from natural water courses passing through the Point Lisa's industrial estate, which collects whatever outfall um, or runoff that comes from industrial sites there, um, as well as direct industrial outfall and 
a direct industrial outfall which passes along the southwestern side of the mangrove system. Um, as I said, the site has been routinely monitored since 2005. So although there hasn't been any significant changes to the health of the system, meaning the girth of the trees, the height of the trees, or the density of the trees, there is some human interference and stresses that has been reported during the surveys. And I have some photos of these things. Um, this spring on the bark of a black mangrove tree, I actually asked a plant pathologist what it was, because it's not adventitious roots. It's actually what they suggested were tumors that is growing along the bark of the tree. I've never seen this on any other mangrove tree, but I've noticed it in this specific uh, wetland system. That's a mangrove tree? Yes, it is. That big? Yes. <laughs> and um, what they suggested is it's an actu actually a bacterial virus infection, which is causing um, these tumors to grow along the bark of the tree. And another thing that you see regularly. This is not sunlight. All of this is actually bottles that get um, deposited within this system as a result of tidal activity and runoff from the uh, the sorry the river that passes in that area. And there's one more thing I think. Oh yes, and this is the industrial um, outflow. That is foam. And sometimes, if you're there, it's actually heated to the point where you see steam rising from it. Are you what? Steam. Steam rising from it. And this is a surfactant. I don't know what the use of that surfactant is, but yes, this can this infiltrates into the mangrove system itself, mixes with the um, tidal activity as well as your <laughs> river that passes through it and enters into the mangrove system. So this is one of the issues that we're doing right now. Next. Second one that is contentious now is the mangrove system in the brain. This system itself um, is stressed because of one, the location it's in. I've actually seen pitch seeps within the mangrove system, so you would see like tree roots coming up through the pitch itself. It's also affected by the fact that there's infrequent flushing, so within this area it's highly saline and you have a lot of dieback occurring as a result of the high salinities in the soil. You also have it being affected by the fishing communities. They actually do cut timber from the periphery of the small mangrove system. Um, this system itself consists of mainly black and white mangroves, uh, depending on the location, black mangroves are found mainly within the interior, white mangroves on the outside. Um, next. Okay, so this is just a, a, one of the photos that I thought was interesting, that you see the red mangrove pop roots along the coastline coming up through the pitch itself, or going through the pitch channel. Um, next. And so this is another uh, stressed environment. As you can see, this is another mangrove here with the same tumors being developed along the bar in the system. And here I have some pictures of that Labre mangrove system and what happened to it after the oil spill in 2003. Um, Specifically, I was surveying that mangrove system because the, there is a proposed um, salt water outfall, a brine water outfall from a desalination plant proposed for the bay. So surveys were done of the mangrove to assess the health and the community structure uh, in terms of doing a baseline survey. So once operations start, you could determine if there was any impact as a result of this outfall. But subsequent to our surveys, the oil spill happened. So I thought I'd bring some pictures to show you exactly what, look, what it looked like. Um, so you can see all of this is tough on the roots themselves. Next to much. And yeah, so this was the oil coming up and this is very close to like Coffee Beach area. Almost solid. Yeah, but remember this area had pitch as well. So this, this area had pitch coming up as well, so the, the oil was covering the pitch, so 
the black could be either petrol or oil plant. And here you have what the streaks of oil looked like, and all there was some dieback that occurred as a result. Right. So what makes this area such a content contentious area, as well as an area that's going to be significantly impacted by humans? is this library system itself, is, it has been proposed that this area be used for um, expansion of the Brighton Port area. So essentially, it has been proposed that this area be cleared for further development. So you have backfilling and all of that occurring, similar to what happened in Point Vistas when you had Point Vistas Industrial Estate being established. So in terms of impacts and human impacts along the West Coast, a lot of what you see uh, in terms of wetland development and wetland impacts have all been related to uh, new projects, new developments, and uh, I guess what our government sees as um, our need or what our, our um, sorry, sustainable not sustainable development. I'm looking for a plan. There's a plan, of, a development plan for Trinidad and Tobago. Because when I I had a meeting with someone once when they were proposing to develop a port at Claxton Bay. And they were using our old development plan, which was developed in the 80s, to state that, well, here was always designated for ports. So, granted, we've already decimated a lot of the mangroves in this area. It was already established, it was already designated as a port. So this is the premise of why we're placing it there. So a lot of our development um, plans and projects are based on primarily all, an old premise of where things should be or what our plan was to develop back in the 80s. And perhaps in terms of our new wetland policies, our new biodiversity policies, we need to reconsider um, what our development plans are and how we can restructure it to encompass preserving some of our wetland systems. Okay.